Before I begin this video, I would like to highlight the crises that are going on currently in Yemen, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Sudan. I recognize that I don't really cover current events that often, so in the description you can find links that give you both information about these crises and also suggest different ways that you can donate. If you are in a financial situation where you can give and you have a heart for giving, I would suggest that you please take a look into this and see what you can do. Thank you. Now, on with the video. Shipping gives a lot of fans that feel dissatisfied by canon an avenue to explore what could be or could have been. Combine this with fan fiction, and you get an outlet to both produce and consume media that you won't be getting from a mainstream company. For a long time, this was an easier way for a lot of LGBT people to feel that they had representation. While gay fictional characters have existed as long as fiction itself, in the last several hundred years, it's been taboo to portray gay characters as anything but one-dimensional villains. You'll see exceptions, sure, like Itineraria, Sardia, Carmilla, and The Picture of Dorian Gray, all of which were less than perfect representations, generally. But, generally, LGBT characters didn't really start to become a thing in English until the 20th century. It took even longer before mainstream artists included LGBT artists, and the world's most popular franchises have still either remained all straight or only just begun to sneak in tokenism, with, again, a few exceptions, of course. But while fiction with corporations behind it, or publishing companies, were afraid to have serious gay characters until recently, fans sought to imagine otherwise. Perhaps the first fan base that resembles fandom as we conceptualize it today, complete with fan fiction, fan art, shipping, speculation, and all, was Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry's 1966 original series captivated audiences, transforming how media was consumed. All of a sudden, people saw being a fan of a work to be part of a cultural identity. And while Star Trek was very progressive for its time, having a black woman and Asian man as lead characters, supporting socialism and condemning war, and was largely concerned with promoting egalitarian altruism, it was not necessarily great in terms of representation of LGBTQ plus people. It said male and female was a universal constant, which it isn't, even among animals and plants on Earth. The show has no openly LGBTQ characters, and when then-closeted George Takei approached Roddenberry about introducing a gay character, Roddenberry elected to say no. But despite a lack of explicit homosexuality, many fans quickly saw Kirk and Spock as in love with each other, and some of the earliest Star Trek fan content was what is referred to as slash shipping, after the fact that Kirk and Spock together romantically or sexually are written with a slash between their names. For a lot of gay, lesbian, and bisexual people, the option to perceive a close relationship between two people of the same gender as romantically or sexually loving allowed them to have more confidence in themselves. After all, if Kirk and Spock, two beloved characters, are gay, why can't people accept them? Of course, as time passed, more openly gay creators developed media and included characters in stated, loving, healthy relationships, and we got better representation. But for a lot of people, headcanoning characters as gay was a way to feel better represented, and many do it to this day. But with all that being said, slash shipping isn't always a pure thing. Now let me be clear, it's not a problem to think Kirk and Spock are a couple, or Xena and Gabrielle, or Finn and Poe, but much like shipping of any couple, there are often pitfalls and problems that people seem to think don't matter due to their ship being supposedly progressive. I have a lot of ground to cover here. Where would I even begin? Well, since I just covered early Star Trek fix, let's take a look at who was making most of this media. Undeniably, there were gay people creating this fanfiction, but in Anne T. Dixon's 1982 analysis of the psychology of the Kirk-Spock relationship, she describes how the majority of fanfic writers are straight women. Now, this is a concern regardless of the content or quality of the works. When the majority of representation of a marginalized group comes from people outside of that group, you're bound to be misinterpreted in issues that the majority doesn't understand. This is evident. But even beyond that, many straight women do not use this material, and material like it, of different characters from various franchises, as means of promoting acceptance or encouraging representation. Rather, they use it as erotic titillation. Before I discuss why this concerns me, I want to talk about why something else concerns me. Straight men's obsession with lesbians having sex. People defend this obsession by saying it's harmless or inconsequential. I may not have to understand it, but it's not doing anything bad, is it? Well, 
Discounting how this still relies on the objectification of women, it would still be feasible for one to perhaps separate their erotic views from their political ones, yes? And that what happens in the fantasy is unrelated to what happens in the real world. In theory, this might sound innocuous, but in reality, taboo is attractive to a lot of people. Lesbians are fetishized by straight men that wouldn't want them to get married, or have children, or be out in public. Furthermore, this places value only in lesbians that appeal to straight men. They may permit two women making out or having sex if they're both conventionally attractive in a stereotypical feminine sense and they get to watch, but women that don't fit that archetype are demonized by the same men, and in real life men have gotten violent when lesbians and bi women do not fit to their fantasy. As with fetishizing any group of people, not only is it disrespectful and objectifying by definition, it also corrupts how you should view that group of people. If your only view of a person is how they can help you be aroused, you've dehumanized them and treated them as less than yourself. And that's that's why it bugs me that the slash shipping communities are so often inundated with pornographic content created by and for straight women. Now, is there a pattern of straight women sexually assaulting gay and bi men? Well, yes, actually. Admittedly, it is a less pronounced trend than the reverse, but that shouldn't matter as the suffering of one warrants addressing. Many women, both lesbian and bisexual, have correctly and competently called out the gross fetishization straight men have of their sexuality. I'm simply raising my concerns with an issue that I have seen go unchecked by many people that claim to be allies. Yet this isn't the only reason I find it inappropriate. As I said, fetishization involves objectification. Straight women thinking of gay men as sassy, passionate, stereotypical forces instead of real people is demeaning. There's some more topics I'd like to cover, and first I'll discuss The Force Awakens to explain why. When Episode 7 came out, a lot of people loved the relationship between Finn and Poe. The two formed a beautiful friendship, and Boyega and Isaac had great chemistry. While the movie and sequel seem to be pointing towards a Finn and Rey romance, and Disney's track record with gay representation makes me wish that they don't try to have a gay couple in Star Wars until they get a gay writer, the couple is admittedly cute, and it's understandable that people like it. But an abundance of the Finn Poe content is, frankly, anti-black. When Finn isn't portrayed as a domineering, aggressive top, he's a naive, clueless bottom. Neither of these portrayals fit with the Finn we see in the movies, but they do fit with classic black stereotypes that you might find in clan propaganda. I know you're not supposed to critique how people ship things, apparently, but if the context of your fanfic is identical to antebellum hate speech, yeah, I'm going to express my distaste. The idea that black men are more sexually driven or potent is born out of fear and hatred from slave owners and segregationists, and these lies have led to deaths of innocent black men accused of assault by white women and white men. Now, white women, as, again, that's who writes the majority of this fiction, exotifying black men and their bodies is not progressive just because the black man is bi. It's as racist as when straight white men treat black and Latina women as inherently more sexual than other women. That is to say, it's extremely racist. And pretending your race fetish is progressive because it's about bi or gay men is both racist and homophobic. Of course, that's not the only racist way Finn Poe is portrayed. Poe, played by a Latino man, is often depicted as a sex addict and hypersexual. Finn, who is in actuality of the same height as Poe, is depicted in a lot of fan art as being noticeably taller than him. This reinforces the tired, dangerous stereotype of the big, powerful black man. And don't get me started on the alternate universes that some of these fics think are sexy. Lastly, though it's not the case for many people, so don't worry if this isn't you, the ship is often used as a way to prevent a black man from being with a white woman, and it serves largely as a secondary ship for Raylo fix. Let me reiterate that I don't think Finpo is a bad ship. Just shipping it in this way is. Regardless, I don't trust JJ. I'll totally add a gay character to Star Trek in Episode 2, and then I won't add a gay character to Star Trek in Episode 2, Abrams, to do gay representation in sci-fi well. Oh, yeah, the Star Trek reboot. Okay. There's another scenario where, rather than have a black person be with a white person, they'll say two male characters have to be gay, even though Spock and Kirk in the reboot are, well, less close, shall we say. People that oppose shipping Spock with Uhura always cite that she's a strong, independent woman, and you already see where I'm going with this. Black women are portrayed as unloved so often in media that it's not even original anymore, either by painting them as headstrong or as so self-sufficient that any love interest would tie them down. A confident black woman having a loving partner is not cliche or heteronormative. It's a positive change from the norm. 
Absolutely, this shouldn't be something where only men can express this love, but the strong, independent black woman that doesn't need love trope needs to be retired. The other fetishization that I see happen a lot is of East Asian men. Suffice to say, there is a large, apparently lucrative brand of homoerotic fiction in Japan referred to as boys love, or yoi. I probably didn't pronounce that right, but seeing as this is exploitative, in this case I don't really care. Boys love, like western slash shipping, began in the early 70s. Also like slash shipping, it is produced by women for women. Like other Japanese erotica, boys love has become popular in the US and the UK, and the terminology and themes associated with the genre have been appropriated to fit any pairing of East Asian men in either fiction or, disgustingly, in real life. For Western women, gay East Asian men are often as other as the cartoons that they consume, serving a purpose only as material for titillation, not as actual men facing undue stress and objectification, racism, and homophobia. Another thing, Avery, the wonderful blogger and analyst behind Visibility of Color, whom I've referenced on the channel before, recently pointed out how in the fandom for the 2017 Beauty and the Beast live-action remake, LeFou is most commonly shipped with Gaston, a man that emotionally abuses him. And this reminded me of a long list of popular MLM ships, involving a character regularly abused by the other. Harry and Draco, Kylo and Hux, Will and Hannibal. Apparently, it's sexy for a man to be regularly harmed, manipulated, and demeaned before he has sex with his abuser. You can hopefully see why I'm disgusted by this stuff, right? Lastly, before I close, I wish to offer my sincerest disdain for slash shipping of minors with adults. Pedophilia does not become okay when it's between two people of the same gender, and drawn or written depictions of minors in sexually explicit situations with adults or with other minors, though perhaps legal in your area, are repulsive to me, and I will not entertain any argument otherwise. Characters like Peter Parker, Harry Potter, and Uzumaki Naruto are commonly sexualized by adults online, and the pretentious assertion that it's okay because they're gay only relies on the homophobic conspiracy that all gay people are pedophiles. The sexualization of minors, in any context, will never be permissible. If you do not agree with that statement, I recommend you seek professional help to overcome your problem. This doesn't mean that you can't think minors are gay or ship them, but sexualizing them is morally abhorrent. Fan fiction can be great. If it's about two adults loving each other, and their love inspires in you a feeling of joy or empathy, even better. But I implore you, if after this video you continue to consume media meant to fetishize gay men, do not allow your perception of gay men to be tainted. If sexual gratification was enough to erase bigotry, straight men would never be sexist. Do not mistake consumption of homoerotica with activism, and do not confuse fantasy for fact. Men loving men is not a fetish, or a genre, or a guilty pleasure. It's a collection of sexual orientation. And honestly, there's enough problems to deal with as is.